hot streak here in Miami, it's gonna hit 95. We ain't got no milk. I ain't getting none neither. Hey, yo! Yo, yo! Now, people, this is gonna be very basic for some of you. What you've got is 64 squares, 32 pieces. It doesn't matter how rich or poor you are, what Ivy League school you may go, may not go to, because chess is the great equalizer. We got a tournament coming up in a couple days. So we need to start really considering if we're serious about what we're doing here or not. Oh! Oh. Baby on the mic, yep. I get hyped. Oh. Don't mess with me, cause chess is life. Yeah. The minute that you lose, you won't be losing. Today's Hager Monday. Oh. The board is fine spending $400 on footballs, but not with sending kids on a road trip to improve their minds. You can have them play marbles for all I care. Just keep the bodies in the seats. You're underestimating me, OK? And more importantly, them. Kids like this from places like Dade County don't ever make it to team regionals. And it shouldn't be too hard for them to swallow. Give up on them. Let their parents give up on them. Let the whole system give up on them. But you know what? I ain't, OK? This moment right here is the happiest I've ever been in my life. So you come in here bragging because you want a trophy? Play to win! These kids have real potential. My mom's tell me, make something of myself. Yes, sir! That's what I'm gonna do. Watch out, world. We coming for you. All four of us. Yo, we can be something special. Just remember, your mind can be your weapon. Ooh. From the streets, we were summoned. Funny, because you've been doing a lot of brown and black movies throughout your career. Like I was just uh, checking out uh, "Hanging Holy. with the Homeboys." Holy, Holy hanging out, out, hanging with the Homeboys. You remember that one? Of course, it's one of my favorite movies. It was my first big hit movie, and uh, we got to Sundance. It was it won the the the, the crowd award. Uh, Joe Basto was this beautiful guerrilla filmmaker. You know, Puerto Rican brother from the South Bronx. Sadly enough, you know, the business kind of broke his heart and disillusioned him. And he really thought that uh, hanging with the homeboys was gonna break him out and bust him out. And, you know, being a Latin man in this country is, is a really difficult task, especially if you're ambitious and wanna be successful. Um, and so that's sadly, but we did this beautiful movie, man. It, it, it was uh, Dougie Dog. Yeah. Uh, Nessa Serrano. I mean, it was such a, it was like, that's what being a homeboy was back in the day. We've been talking about Latinx directors and he was one of them, Joseph Vasquez, yes, that not many people really talk about. Frank and so Reyes was another, wrote, directed, directed, produced his own stuff. I mean, Empire was, was an incredible flick. You know, we got into Sundance with that one as well. Made crazy money for a Sundance film for only $2 million. Made like uh, 20 million at the box office. Although I would have made more, but <laughs> all I I'll tell you why. I'll tell why, you why. why? Because our contracts all were at 21 million. We would all get crazy bumps. And you're like, wait a oh, minute, the wow. movie stopped just before everybody got their crazy payoffs. Hmm, think about that. And then it made 50 million on DVD, you know? Huh. So by design. It was eighth, it was eighth, eighth in, the, in the, the top 10 movies. It was by design, dude, because they didn't want to pay you guys up, man. That's a problem that we all face. But now you're uh, doing your feature directorial debut with Critical Thinking. You star as Mario Martinez in a real life story about a teacher who in 1998 guided five black and brown students from Miami Jackson High School to become the first ever inner city school to win the U.S. National Chess Championship. So, uh, you know, if I had to describe the movie, It'd be, if searching Bobby Fischer had a baby with Stand and Deliver, you'd get critical things. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah, it, it is kind of like the, a love child. They had a little love child. <laughs> they had a little love child. But, but, a lot of, but a lot of passionate sex first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, because of critical thinking, I had to rewatch Stand and Deliver because there were so many things that I saw that were commonalities between those two movies, like for example, the part that you say that chess is the great equalizer, and in Stand and Deliver, Jaime Escalante, where James Almost's character says, math is the great equalizer. Mm. I wanted to talk to you how much that movie, as a director and oh, as an God. actor, uh, had an influence in critical thinking. Oh my God, because you know, back then, you know, we hardly saw ourselves, man. You, you hardly saw yourself in any positive role, no superheroes, no comics, no, 
<laughs> no TV show, no picture book for children, uh, no sitcom. It, it was impossible. And then when you saw something like that, it was like, it like knocked the air out of you. You're like, oh my God, we, <laughs> we exist. We contribute. <laughs> we're positive. We're intellectual. We're gifted. You know, uh, it, it just, you know, it was, it, 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 just, it was just a little bit of oxygen you needed to get, to keep going in life, you know, and keep believing in your dreams. For me as a, wanting to be an actor and aspiring director and writer. What made you decide to not just be in this, but direct this? Because, you know, this is quite a challenge, I think. You know, it's not easy to make playing chess interesting. There was a horrible book that came out in the 1990s that really devastated my self-esteem. It was called The Bell Curve. And at the time, nobody knew that they were fake scientists and that the research was shoddy and, and, and made up. But it was the proof of the book was the, the, what the guys were trying to prove was that Latin and black people were born genetically, intellectually inferior. Wow. I remember this book. It, it, they were everywhere. <laughs> you know, they were on PBS. They were on all the yeah. news shows. And I was like, what? Am I really born intellectually inferior? Can I not achieve genetically? Obviously, it was bogus, made up, but who knew at the time till they were called out and they called out all their fake tests. So when this movie came up, I was like, this is like the antidote to that, to that bullshit. This is the, the vaccine against it. This is the one that says, look, these kids from the most underprivileged backgrounds, the most defunded public schools, they're still gifted. They're still talented. They're still street intellectuals, ghetto nerds, bookworms. You know, they exist. All they need is a, somebody to nurture them with a little water and boom, they sprout, you know? And, and that's what this movie is for me. It's the proof that we, that that book is wrong, that we are intellectually gifted, that we are equal. You know, they've done some tests in, um, in Florida public schools because they were trying to find out why Latin and black kids were not in the gifted programs. And then the, t the research found out that it was when the parents and the teachers were the ones selecting, they didn't pick the Latin and black kids. They picked the white kids. When they took all that out and put just metrics, measurements, tests, the classes filled up with Latin and black kids. They were the majority. When, when they took out the parents and the teachers who were profiling, obviously, and, uh, and damaging that, that situation for those kids, their futures. One of the things I wanted to ask you in particular, John, uh, was about the challenges that you must have had in making this movie happen. Uh, Baby, did you I, I want to write down, I forgot. I gotta get I gotta get that test with that Florida. T I want to get the right name for that. I'm making myself a post-it note. There you go. You probably write a lot of those, man. Such a uh, brainstorming and everything. Here it is. Here it is. So you can see it. There it is, right there. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> yes. Dan and the Liver was released by Warner Brothers. Uh, La Bamba uh -huh. was released by Columbia Pictures. So there was a history yeah. before of. Hollywood studio companies releasing Latinx prestige films. La Bamba hit the Billboard charts at number one as well. Uh, Edward James Olmos was nominated for an Oscar. There is the ability for this to come back, to renew, to oh, have yeah. a rebirth of these oh, films. Yeah. It doesn't need to be a rebirth. We just need a birth. Come on, I mean, <laughs> we didn't just get here. Right. We've been here 500 years. We discovered America, we found it, we built it, the British took it from us. The Americans took the rest. And before that, we were the biggest empires in the world. The Incas, the Mayas, the Aztec, Comanche, Apache. And then we didn't stop there. Land people have fought in every single war America has ever had. And we're the most decorated minority in each and every single war. American Revolutionary War, 10,000 Latinx people fought. We had a general, Galvez, with an army Bernardo of 3, Galvez. Puerto yeah. Ricans. Puerto Ricans, Cubans, Mexican Americans freed slaves and Native Americans, and they kicked the British out of the South so they couldn't uh, uh, trap the, the, the Patriots in New England. And I'm not talking about the football team. I'm talking about, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the Minutemen. And then 20,000 was fought in the Civil War with getting medals of honor. Puerto Rican Lieutenant Augusto Rodriguez, uh, uh, Chilean um, Felipe Pizarro got a medal of honor from Abraham Lincoln, the first Admiral David Faragut. 120,000 was fought in World War I. 500,000 of us fought in World War II. That's a huge contribution and sacrifice to the making of America. Where are those stories? I mean, we have millions of stories. What's damning it up? What's blocking, cock blocking our success? Did you 
did you encounter any resistance to make this movie? I had heard that you couldn't even get the I, money to I've had get this film my done. Whole life. You pitch them all kinds of movies, comedies, sitcoms. They don't get it. They don't get you. They don't see you. They they laugh. They go, it's well written, but you know, when and when this movie, I was like, I got a tight story. I got a certain amount of success and leverage. Dito Montel wrote a dope story. It's true. And I go to the studios and they tell me, you know, Latin people don't want to see Latin people. I'm going, what? I'm wow. Like, my head's like, <laughs> Latin people don't want to see feel good movies. I'm excuse me. What do we want to see? Just depressing uh, suicidal flicks. I mean, where did you get your where did you get your studies from? And then so I couldn't do it with the studios because they don't see they don't see us, man. They don't get us. They don't love us. They don't care for us. So I went and raised the money myself. And here we are. Now, did you always want to direct it? Would, did this come to you as something you wanted to direct from, from day one? No, no, I, I was just going to star in it. And then they offered it to me to direct. I was like, yeah, I, I, I think I can really bring value to this flick. I really think I could add a little extra and, and get it done right. Within the, the script, you know, you sneak in everything that Jack was just talking about. You know, you have a line in there for the teacher who says something about history and how, you know, brown and black, you know, is just completely erased yeah. from history. So we don't have that sense of uh, not just history, but just, you know, pride even for right. what we've achieved. You know, what and our no, and other people don't see us in the same way either because they don't see our achievements either. That's how a white supremacist can come into a Latin community and shoot up 23 and kill 23 people living their lives, their Latin lives, you know, just in a mall. Because if you had seen our contributions in textbooks and history books, you would be respecting us and you wouldn't be attacking us. And nobody would allow you to do that when you see Black and Latin contributions to America in textbooks. And I'll tell you something, in Arizona, Latin history is against the law. And in Texas, a lot of teachers told me they're allowed only one day to teach Latin history in their history classes, even though Texas is 40% Latin and 12% Black. Well, you know, we, we spoke to uh, Kevin Wilmot and Trey Byers the other day about, uh, about a movie called 24th that just came out. And he was right. talking about the My same- My editor edited that movie. Get out of here. Jamie Kirkpatrick, he loves that flick. He talks so, talks big, that movie big. And we talked about you in that podcast about, yes, you know, about the problems of, of Latino representation. Because I had said to him, I said, listen, man, much like John Leguizamo, I have not seen myself in these- in these movies, and the idea is, is there even an appetite, John, for Latino historical dramas, much like 24th about the black infantry that went apeshit in 1917 because they couldn't take it anymore? Why is it that the Civil War, the American Revolutionary War, World War II, all these figures, all these leaders we have not seen, is there not an appetite for that at all? No, I, I think there's an appetite. It's just because in, the, in our history textbooks, it's not there, so people start thinking that it's a fantasy, that it's made up, that it's Hollywood. That's part of the problem. Uh, Band of Brothers should have had a brown brother. <laughs> you know what I mean? We were there, and black brothers were there as well, you know? Uh, we need the representation. Uh, it, it's, the appetite is there. Look, Lynn manuels Hamilton is the biggest hit Broadway in Broadway history in the 100 odd two years or whatever, 150 years of Broadway's history. If you would have pitched that to a, a network, to a studio, <laughs> to a streamer, he would have never got done. They would have been, excuse me, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Hamilton is Puerto Rican and Burke is black. The founding fathers would turn in their grave. They didn't, I, I gotta, excuse me, but they did not speak in rap in the 1700s, I assure you. Right. It would have never got done, but because there are no gatekeepers on Broadway, that's why I get my shit done on Broadway, because there's no mm. gatekeepers. There's only, you got your script, it's tight, it's dope. You can raise the money, bam, it's yours. You rent out a shell. Well, let me ask you another question because looking at your life and your career, uh, everything that, that Jack and I are talking about and what, what part of the show is uh, about identity and representation. And, you know, we, we touched upon even last week or last show with Kevin Wilmot, we talked about, you know, the importance of not just knowing history. His quote was that, uh, we don't own history. History owns us. Uh, what are your thoughts on just representation? How will that change? Because for you, you've played every kind of cat. You've played clowns. You've played 
slots, <laughs> you play features, you know, so you've shown not only can you, you can work in any medium, you can do comedy, you can do, you know, what more needs to happen, do you think, for I, the identity, not just for us to see ourselves, but for others to start to see us differently? Executives, you need, we, we need Latin executives. We need, you know, with 50% of the population of Los Angeles, Hollywood, and less than 3% of the, the, the faces in front of the camera, less than 2% of the crew behind the camera, and less than 1% of the, the, the stories. 50% of the population, that's cultural apartheid. In New York, we're equal to whites in population and less than 1% of the staff that New York Times, New York Magazine, anything with a New York banner. How is that possible? That's cultural apartheid. You know what I mean? That's, that's, it's called psychosocial erasure. That's what we live through being a Latin person and a black person in America, but especially Latinx, which is the least represented minority in children's picture books when we're 30% of the United States public schools. How does a kid build his self-esteem? How does he build his self-love and his self-worth? Never seeing himself represented in, in children's picture books. Then it keeps growing on as you get older and older, the lack of representation, the lack of seeing yourself in a, in a successful way. How do you project yourself? How do other people say, oh, you know, Latin people should be running this company. Latin people should be the, the New York Times editor. Because we should be. You know, where, where we have metrics, we fucking win. Like in Spotify, Jay Balvin, my, my Colombian brother, is, is number one international world star because you can measure those hits. In the Billboard, my Dominican sister Cardi B is number one. Camila Cabello was in the top 10, my Cuban sister. Maluma, my other Colombian brother. Uh, Bad Bunny, I mean, you name it. We're in, in baseball, because we got stats. In politics, AOC, Veronica Escobar, uh, Xavier Bercera, uh, uh, Attorney General in, in California, Catalina Cruz, Cindy Polo in Miami, uh, Debbie, where, where we can count votes, but when it's an executive's taste and his opinion, we're done. When it's an, an executive at, at New York Times and it's their opinion, we're done. Can you please explain Hispanics for Trump for me? Can you please explain Ted Cruz? <laughs> That's Rubio. like Roach's Parade. Wait. That's all I <laughs> <laughs> I, I find it, I find Repu Latin Republicans for Trump disgusting. I mean, I, I don't I, I don't mind Latin Republicans, but for Trump, who said horrible things about my Mexican brothers and sisters, who try to take away the bilingual government page, who's limiting the immigration of legal immigrants to our country only from Latin and Black countries, who who threw paper towels at at Puerto Ricans who were. At, I, 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 in dire straits and then jokingly said I, should, I want to sell Puerto Rico. Disgusting. I mean, how can you, how can you look at yourself in the mirror and call yourself Latin and go, I don't care about my other Latin brothers because I just care about me. Nah, that doesn't, that doesn't, no, no. You can be Republican, but you can't be for Trump. You just can't. Similar to what Jack asked you, and I would love to get your perspective on this. One of the things that Jack and I have discussed, and, and I actually, I, I feel like I, I was a bit naive. I did not realize there was so much uh, hate or, or animosity that there were so many Latinos who don't like black people at all, who are, hate the Black Lives Matter movement. Like, I don't understand that. I don't understand I, I, that. I really haven't heard that much of, of, of that because I've seen more, I don't know, maybe maybe the, the, the grams that I follow and the Facebook pages, they all seem mad positive. That's what I've seen. Uh, it, it's been disturbing for me. I, yeah. I something I never noticed. Well, you know, there's, you there's mad a, racism in the Latin community. I mean, they, I mean, all that. I mean, look, look at look at that beautiful lady who was in Roma. Yeah, Lita yeah, that beautiful indigenous face, and and they put her on the cover of of one of the Vogue. top magazines. She got so much hate from Latin people across Latin America. How could you put such an ugly face? How could you put this and that? She's not attractive enough. You know, there, there's so much self hate. So much European um, ideals of beauty still inflicted upon us. You know, you, you look at you look at Latin TV and you go, you see the, some of the whitest looking people, and you're like, yo, that's like one percent of the population in any of those countries. How are they? That's the standard of beauty. You, you, you know, that that's that's it's a huge problem in our communities. Our self hate. My aunts with dark skin. 
you know, and they would always, their, their face would be like 50 shades lighter than their neck because they didn't have enough money to buy the neck part makeup <laughs> to lighten their necks. What did you, what did you make of the Goya CEO when he said that Donald what Trump is, is a brand builder? Did you stop buying Goya products? Should we all as Latinos stop pr uh, promoting that? Because you know, it was a, it was a moral conflict that I particularly had. I grew up with Goya. Of course we did. I grew up with Goya. It was part of my childhood. And then all of a yeah, sudden yeah. I have to kind of like hate this guy. What is your perspective on how Latinos should kind of look at this situation? Because it's not something we've ever had to really confront. No, no, no. But I mean, he's a moron. First of all, anybody who says that Trump is a successful businessman, six bankruptcies. <laughs> if they, they said that if Trump had left all the millions that his father gave him and never touched it, he'd be so much richer now. And then he, he bankrupted a, a casino. Who bankrupts a casino? <laughs> the, the tables are rigged to the favor of the house. It's like he, he's, he's bankrupting America now, man. The inflation that's coming from Trump's policies are just printing money and, and, and lowering the interest rates. Inflation is going to bite us in the ass. Anyway, yeah, Goya, you know, goodbye, yeah. <laughs> because I'm done with them, you know. I, you know, I started. I looked up how to make my own sasson. My own. My wife's making her own. Right. Sasson. And you know what? Take out the MSG. Take out the nitrates. We're better off without all that garbage right. in our food. What is it? What uh, sasson is? What? Uh, garlic powder, onion powder, coriander powder, cumin. Uh, Put some achote, paprika in there. Salt and pepper. Paprika. No, yep. no, achote. Achote. Yeah, ah, okay. that's our indigenous <laughs> red, uh, red, red dye kind of flavor. I've got some in my closet. Um, well, let me ask you another question. Uh, you know, you mentioned before the importance, uh, you were talking about images and representation. We had a, a, a writer, a illustrator named Eric Velasquez on, and he had written a children's book because he's an Afro Latino, uh, Puerto Rican, you know, from the Bronx and dark, darker, darker than me. And when he wrote this book, it was called Grandma's Records, and it came out, it was the first Afro-Latino book for oh, children wow. ever. And ever. this is like in the 2000s. Now, does that, A, does that blow your mind? And then the second part of that is, what was it like for you now working with all these young actors? Because you have some great talent in there. Oh, wow. That, are, you, are you inspired by the future? Oh, yeah. Do you think some of these are going to do, because some of them, some of your actors are filmmakers too. You know, it was incredible. I mean, First of all, it was so difficult to pick my talent because there was so many Latinx and black wow. youth in America, hundreds. They were all blew my mind. First of all, I was just like so pumped up that I was like, oh my God, you're better than, oh wait, you're even better. Wow, you, the talent was ridiculous. So to, to, the only way for me to narrow it down was like, Oh, I'm just going to pick people that look like the character or, or they embody the personality exactly. So, right. Because, you know, I, I'm directing, I'm in it, I'm producing it. I don't have the time to develop it all the way there. You know, I need you to be halfway there already. So that's what I did, man. The, the amount of talent out there, dude, is so beautiful. Mm. There was like this whole conversation about whether white filmmakers, white storytellers, should they still be... Uh, telling black stories, telling Latin X stories. Where do you feel, like for example, one of the big problems is like In the Heights is coming out, yet John Chu, an Asian, uh, he's the one that directed it. Shouldn't it been have a, a Latino tell that story? Shouldn't Latinos tell their stories as opposed to white creators and white storytellers tell our stories? No, that's an interesting question, man. It's a, it's a, I mean, in, in, in the ideal world, we should all be directing everybody's stories because we should all be empathic and and uh understanding of each other's stories because we're all human beings it's all the same story in a way you know but and, and but it doesn't flow that way you know obviously latin actors directors are not really asked to direct a lot of white movies although alfonso Cuarón's done pretty well and and guillermo del toro and yanara too they do a lot of white films and not as many latinx films uh you know it, it's complicated man i mean i I, I like my Latinx directors to have an opportunity and a chance. But if somebody's championing a story for us, I, I'll take that too. I don't like when, you know, like Argo, <laughs> somebody playing, taking a, a Puerto Rican role from a, you know, FBI when we have such few positive stories. That one, that one's kind of tough for me. What kind of advice do you give to young 
people coming up in the business now because you've been in the business for a minute and you know you i'm certain like you said you felt you faced all kinds of resistance so two-part oh, question yeah. how much do you think things have changed and what advice do you give to young latinx and you know brown and black people of color who want to be in this business i say say yes to everything you know even if it's demeaning you know even if it's catering for a movie or or being an assistant's assistant, you got to do it all because some some way you're you're learning and absorbing, and you'll be able to use that uh, and weaponize that information. Uh, secondly, I say, don't wait for Hollywood, man. Do not wait. It ain't coming for you. <laughs> Make it, write it, produce it, direct it, watch it yourself if you have to. Do it on social media. Just keep putting it out there. Keep writing it. Don't stop. You know, we, 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 hopefully, this is a a reckoning this this time right now and hopefully things are going to change big time and i have a good feeling about it because i i really do feel like studios are really trying to be sensitive and understand that they have been in the wrong and that they've been excluding us completely latin and black people um and, and so i i've seen them reach out i really have seen publishers because that's where you know that's where it's at the worst is for latin and black especially latinx um and movie executives are reaching. There are, there are, there, there. I think there is a conscious effort. I, I think we're going to see a big difference after this COVID and and after this election. I think we really are going to see the impacts of, of of a new America, even though we have all this white supremacy, QAnon, conspiracy nonsense going on, and 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 the hatred, the pushback because we're finally getting our, our due, you know, and and black people are finally getting the respect they deserve. John, what is the future of Latin history for morons? Is this it? Are you still touring it? If you can give us an update on that. And if you can also give us an update on Kiss My Ass Tech, which is a musical you've been working on for quite some time. I ain't kissing your ass tech. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me again. <laughs> <laughs> but will we see it on Broadway whenever the theater comes back? What is the future of that? Well, uh, Latin History for Morons is on Netflix. I'm not going to tour with it anymore because I, I, I put it down. But I, I am from the tour, I taped some new bits that are so dope. I got a little more courage to put in more history. So that's going to be, there's going to be a new release of Latin History for Morons on, on Netflix. And, and Kiss My Ass Dick, yo, it's gotten so tight. It's so funny. The music is so tight and dope. It, it, it's going to be mind blowing. It's going to be like Book of Mormon meets Spam a lot, but really funny, man. And, and about conquest, because, you know, conquest is hilarious. <laughs> and, uh, I'm hoping, you know, hoping Broadway, uh, maybe 20, 21, through spring, 2022 spring. Oh, okay. All right. Well, uh, John, I also want to ask you for you now, uh, doing this and having directed this, this feature film uh, and the temperature and everything where you are, you, you've done Broadway, you've got this new show coming out. What kind of films do you want to be making in this next chapter of your career? What, oh, what do yeah, you want yeah, to do? well, I want to do a superhero. I want to do a World War II movie. I want to do a Vietnam movie. I want to do a World War One. I. I want to do an American Revolutionary War movie. I want to do incredible stories. You know, 6,000 Latinx people between 1830 and 1930 were lynched burned alive and shot a lot of them children crossing the border for school they would hang them uh, i i want to tell those stories you know that's why i feel like land people disrespecting black people is so crazy because we have such a shared history you know the same abuse of jim crow existed for land people no mexicans or dogs allowed you know there, there were those signs everywhere and uh we just need to respect each other more and i want to tell those stories you know i really i really there's so many great stories of 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 uh, um, Sylvia Melendez. I want to tell her story. Menendez. She was the, in 1940s. She was fighting segregation in California schools because Latin kids weren't allowed to go in white schools, and she went and fought with uh, the Supreme Court, and she paved the way for Brown versus Board of Ed. That's a powerful story. She was given the Medal of Honor by by Obama himself. Well, John, thank you so much, man. I, I, we really appreciated everything. Thank uh, you, guys, man. I appreciate you guys. Absolutely. Much love.